Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. In this episode, we're talking about guns. Whatever your political leanings are, you have to admit that guns play a big role in pop culture, whether it's written fiction, movies, television, or video games. But as gun-obsessed as we are, we often get them wrong, portraying them in a wildly unrealistic way. Here to talk about that today is Nate Buffet from leftist military podcast What a Hell of a Way to Die. Nate's a troop, which means you can't criticize anything he says or does, no matter what. It also means that he knows a lot about guns. Hi, Nate. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I I should qualify that that I was a troop. I'm actually oh, sorry. not. I'm not even <laughs> on inactive ready reserve anymore. I've been completely out of the military for about four years. I, I, I formally got out in 2014. Um, but for about a year or so, I was still on their list, and now I'm no longer on it. And I still get voicemails and calls periodically from recruiters trying to get me to come back in, even though I don't even live in America anymore. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very glad to not be a troop anymore, especially now that, uh, that things keep getting dumber and dumber. I was an infantry officer in the Army for seven years. I uh, commissioned in 2007. Um, I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009. I spent about a, a little over a year there and then um, went to another unit, went to, to basically a training unit in Korea and then got out after seven years. So um, since then, I've been a freelance writer and I'm now uh, a podcast producer and co-host and general digital media producer. And I live in the United Kingdom. Cool, cool. Awesome. Do you think that unrealistic portrayals of guns can negatively influence people's behavior? Like, do you think it can encourage people to use firearms in a way that's irresponsible? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think in two ways, I think one, there's a kind of cavalier attitude towards using guns that, that people pick up, I think through both like osmosis when they're around people that handle them unsafely. And then also through pop culture, films, video games, etc. cetera. Um, I think, one of the things that's drilled into you from day one in the military when it comes to handling weapons is that they're incredibly dangerous and that basically, uh, so the, they've, uh, they've changed basic training a lot, but one of the only times now in basic training where as a, as a soldier going through training, the drill sergeants can get their hands on you and actually physically you know, grab you and throw you and stuff is, is on the firing range because it's so mm. dangerous. And so all these rules are drilled into you about never point a weapon at anything you're not intending to shoot and, and always keep, keep your finger out of the trigger well unless you're literally moving it in there to pull the trigger. Things along those lines. But then America has a very uh, you know, long, enduring history with guns. And so right. you'll see things portrayed where you know, if somebody's knowledge about guns comes from whatever they've learned from TV or movies or video games. Um, and they weren't in the military and they didn't go through any sort of particularly rigorous training or even like structured training when it comes to getting a gun, they're able to buy one and go to a range or go out in the woods and shoot it. I think, you know, the, the, those habits aren't going to be drilled into them. Of and course. so you, you hear about this all the time about, you know, very sad stories about, you know, children dying or wounding uh, themselves or their parents because their parents left guns out, you know, in a very cavalier way. You know, a uh, woman, I remember not too long ago, a woman, uh, her like two year old shot her, I think, because oh, God. she had a like a semi automatic handgun in her purse and her purse was in the back of the car and it hadn't been there but 30 seconds, but it was long enough for this child to reach over, and open it up, and get a hold of the gun and shoot it. Um, and so, <sighs> you know, things like that leaving or and, and things like that, even like leaving around in the chamber so that, you know, especially in weapons, if they don't have a particularly, you know, like heavy press or mechanical safety release or some weapons just don't have safeties, things like that, you know, so things that 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 would freak me out and would worry me as someone who used guns professionally. Uh, right. You see people doing that a lot. And I think a lot of that comes from it's hard to find portrayals of guns that make it. <laughs> as clear as it needs to be about how like boring and also dangerous it is like boring mm -hmm. in the sense that if you're following the rules, it's, you're not, it's not going to be like a shoot 'em up action movie, but like no one's going to get shot accidentally. Um, right. And also dangerous they are in the sense that it only takes one little bit of mishandling things. You know, you drop a gun, it can, it, depending on the kind of gun, it can, it can go off. Um, you know, if you are, leave it unattended, it's very easy for it to get, um, for a child to take it. If you, if you try to use one, you know, if, if, if you're in a situation and you suddenly pull a gun on someone and you're, you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to have. I mean, most people, as I understand the statistics, many people, if not most people who die uh, in situations where they were firing guns, you know, or they were, a gun was involved in some kind of altercation, 
Um, I, I, I don't want to speak definitively because I'm sure there's, there's somebody who can, who can cite a statistic and tell me I'm an idiot, but it's not uncommon for people to be disarmed and then killed by their own gun. Wow. So things are, you know, like if you don't know what you're doing, and most people don't, uh, right. dumb things can happen. And I do think that pop culture, society, film kinds of things have a tendency to kind of downplay the consequences. Yeah. You know, a soldier of mine was fucking around at a checkpoint one time and like jokingly challenged a friend to like a wrestling match. And uh, he had a nine mil uh, service weapon and it was the safety was on, but it was in like a holster and it somehow came out and he went up getting shot through the spine and paralyzed and he, and he had to be medevaced out of Afghanistan and he'll, he'll never walk again. Jeez. So things like that happen, you know, um, and, 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 and the funny thing about that is, is that the, the service pistol that people carry in the army, he was a medic. That's why he had one uh, right. is a is a M1911 Beretta. It's a big gun in the sense that like it's heavy and the trigger pull is heavy and like the safety, the safety lever is like pretty heavy to push and like the hammer has to be pulled all the way back. And like it's. It, 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 as far as like being mechanically big and clunky so as to avoid accidental firings it's one of the the more difficult guns to fire out there and yet still you know wow. accidents like that happen another kid from our battalion who was another medic shot himself through the foot on the, uh, sitting in a porta john uh accidentally i don't wow. know what he was doing with it but that kind of thing happened and so and that's in the military where like we train a lot on these things yeah yeah so, I mean, anybody who's been in the military can, can tell stories about stupidity with weapons. So, yeah, I, I do worry sometimes <laughs> with the way that they're portrayed, because if, if people get their hands on guns and act that way, then very dumb and very preventable things will happen. Right. And movies really do glamorize like unbelievably unsafe stuff. Like, oh, yeah. The old timey Westerns where the guy, where the where the sheriff like twirls the gun on his finger, which uh, not a great idea. Or the things where like someone's in a car and they shoot inside the car, like through their own windshield and hit somebody. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah. first of all, first of all, you'd, you'd, you'd be blinded and basically deafened by that if the windows weren't open. And even if they were mm. open, it's still so fucking loud. Second, right. like there's no there's no guarantee the bullet's not going to either ricochet and hurt you or kill you inside the car or cause glass to fly out at you when it's fired that way from a shattered windshield and, and harm you, you know, and especially if you're moving. There's no guarantee that bullet's going to go through glass straight through and actually hit your target. So Absolutely. seeing that done, it's like <laughs> you basically need 21st century CGI to be able to make that happen because there's no way it could happen in real life. I see. OK, uh, well, why don't we start off then by just talking about basic safety? You've touched on it already, but movies really love to portray like elaborately choreographed gunplay. Mm -hmm, the hero mm -hmm. just pretty much like juggling guns or something. And oh, yeah, I understand in real life, you need to be a little more careful about that about where you point it and uh, trigger discipline is is the phrase. Uh, I've yeah, heard. yeah. Can it's you talk a little bit about what trigger discipline is? Trigger discipline refers to people have a tendency if they're not paying attention to rest their finger inside the trigger well, especially if they're carrying a rifle. Um, if, say if you're if you're in the military, you're hunting or something where you're going to be carrying a rifle. So both arms or both hands are going to be occupied. People have a tendency to kind of it, holding it in a position we would call the low ready, where your hand, your right hand, the trigger hand is kind of up by your chest, and your lower hand, uh, your your left hand, or your your support hand is basically resting on the stock, you know, kind of lower down towards your hip as you're walking. Mm -hmm. People will have a tendency to put their finger in the trigger well, and that's that's a problem because if you fall, if you're surprised, if you're startled, if something happens, you could easily jerk the trigger. And depending on the weapon, it's it's unsafe. Now, in terms of how we train people. And how I presume law enforcement trains people. I don't. I don't know. I've never done anything with law enforcement. They. I would assume they would not be walking around with a weapon on fire. But but you're not sure. Like, I, you're, you, I don't know. And by that I mean that you would have the safety on until literally you were about to shoot and you would flip it up as you were raising the the rifle to fire. But some handguns, for example, have. Uh, they either have no safety or they have safeties where it's basically it's like the the space between your thumb and your index finger, the kind of meaty part of your thumb joint. Uh, there's kind of a like a button press catch on the the uh, the pistol grip on a handgun, and that basically when your hand is in that position, it's kind of pushing that in as you're holding right, the, the, the right. pistol. That's enough to activate the safety, and then you can fire it. So yeah, I could definitely finger, see you squeezing that accidentally yeah, by mistake. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, you know, I, tr I I I basically have aside from like 
my dad's got some handguns and like a 22 rifle that I've fired like on a range. Uh, I've only ever trained on the AR-15 sort of but military version of those things. So like M16 and then an M4 rifle and then a 1911 pistol, which is a 9mm Beretta. Mm. So uh, those have deliberate safety things. But even on those, we train soldiers absolutely do not put your finger in the trigger well into, unless you are raising the rifle up to shoot or the pistol up to shoot. Uh, you, it, because it's just a safety thing. You absolutely don't want to get in the habit because one of the things that we hammer down on people is that um, all bets are off when you're in a dangerous situation. And if you have a bad habit where you have an unthinking habit, you're not deliberately doing things, then stuff can change when you're under stress. And the last thing you want to have happen if you're in a situation where you need to be using the gun you're carrying is, oh, no, I shot myself in the foot because I pulled the fucking trigger and the weapon was on fire. Ooh. You know what I mean? So that kind of thing right. can happen. So trigger discipline um you'll see this a lot where i mean i i I used to be a little bit more centrist lib now i've gone like just full-on leftist socialist but the centrist lib veterans you'll see that a lot where people will 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 be online kind of complaining and and calling out stuff about photos of like you know gun aficionados gun nut people posting their gun photos online and invariably they're they're mishandling the weapons you know their fingers are in the trigger well they're Mm. pointing them at people as a joke stuff like that and those are huge red flags to anyone who knows anything about weapon safety right like never just you just don't point it at anybody unless no no you're 100 percent prepared to to pull the trigger like don't don't point it at anything you're not intending to shoot is is absolutely the rule and like it's it's just i mean we we have a whole thing about i say we i'm not in the military anymore Mm -hmm. um we had a whole thing about even stuff in training we would call flagging which is like if you are doing a thing where you're 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 carrying your weapon at the the low ready or like you're doing a ready up drill or, or even if you're just like moving through something you absolutely never want your barrel line of sight to cross and, and point at someone so you right. have to be very cautious of where you're pointing things even you know when you're slinging a weapon or you're handing somebody a weapon like you're you're always paying attention to the what we call the the, the muzzle the, the the front end of the barrel um where that muzzle is pointing and then also what's happening with the trigger and then make sure the weapon's on safe and then one thing I that see. i didn't touch on is um you see this a lot. This doesn't really get touched on a ton in entertainment. I think in video games more so now, especially right. now that they're more realistic. But our, our standard practice was unless you were about to go out, say like you were leaving a base or a secure area and you were going out on a combat patrol uh, or in training, if you like step out of the training area to go do like a training lane or something like that, uh, you don't have a bullet in the chamber. You don't have mm-hmm. a, a round in the chamber. Rather, you have you you what you we would typically do if we were in in like a rear area but we were carrying weapons was we would have either the magazine with live ammunition in the magazine well but no round in the chamber mm-hmm. or the magazine completely out and the magazine well empty as we were walking around on base it depended on the rules but so one of the things you'll see that that is people the idea like oh you you walking around with a round in the chamber like cops might do that i don't know but Soldiers only do that when they're expecting to potentially be in, in a gun battle, if that makes sense. I see. And so, like, storing a weapon. Like, I don't own guns. And in the U.K., it would be harder for me to own guns than in the U.S. But it's a big thing to not to not leave, you know, around chambered when you're storing a weapon. for. And I so see. That makes sense. That whole, like, chick-chick sound, things like that, people pulling the slide on a handgun or something like that, that's typically what that's doing is that's chambering around. So that mechanism, you are... Uh, by you know on a, on an M4 pulling the charging handle back uh, and releasing it, or on a pistol pulling the slide back and releasing it, what that's doing is that's pulling a, a round out of the magazine, and then when it slides forward, it's seating it inside the. I, I'm going to forget the the doctrinal term here, but basically where the bullet rests so that the firing pin can can detonate the charge when you pull the trigger. If I that see. makes sense. So the long story, kind of simple version of this is. Unless you legitimately think you're about to get in a firefight, you have to be able to fire at a moment's notice. You don't carry the weapon around with a, with a round in the chamber. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you have to to charge it and then fire, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see. So I know in movies they, they love to have that moment where the guy pulls back the hammer or pumps the shotgun because it looks cool. But yeah. uh, I understand usually that's inaccurate. That's not really an appropriate time to do it like well it depends on what you're doing but yeah i mean i suppose it you know i had a a friend of my dad's was an old merchant marine guy and he um he traveled in an rv 
and he said, you know, he had a pump action shotgun and, and he said, you know, it's not really that I, it's not my preferred weapon. It's, it's actually really, really like powerful. And so like for somebody of his age, it, it was maybe too much gun when you got down mm-hmm. to it, but he knew that if somebody was breaking in or he was worried there was someone breaking in that just by charging the pump action on that, uh, on that, that shotgun, that noise is so distinct and so uh, frightening if you know what you're hearing that people oh, are yeah. like, oh, I'm getting the fuck out of here. So that, that, that will, um, th- that does happen in real life. And obviously like, okay, say we were about to get to step off a patrol or something like that. As soon as we, we crossed out of the, the wire or whatever we were doing, we'd all chamber rounds. But mm-hmm. as soon as we got back in the base, we dropped, you know, you drop the magazine out, you, you charge uh, to remove that round from the chamber, you put it back in the magazine and you walk around without the weapon, you know, ready to fire, if that makes sense. Okay, that, made, that makes sense, I think. Um, all right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about noise. You mentioned before the example of someone shooting in a car and you'd mm-hmm. go deaf and blind. So... Um, <laughs> I, I know that when you're shooting at a gun range, you gotta put the the headphones on. You've gotta like yeah. dampen the noise because that shit's loud. Yeah, they're very loud. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely a thing missing in in movies. I'm guessing John Wick would have gone deaf probably <laughs> from from his uh, yeah, adventures. Yeah, I, I was gonna say. I, also, I was thinking <laughs> of the Matrix. It's like I guess in the Matrix you can't go deaf because yeah. Lord knows otherwise. So going blind, I think in a situation where you're in a confined space like that, especially like shooting through glass, it, it's a very good chance there's gonna be smoke and the, the kind of like expelled powder and stuff that comes out when you fire a weapon like that plus mm-hmm. the possibility of glass and stuff breaking so noise absolutely like you you would basically deafen yourself or you at least give yourself very significant hearing damage doing that but it's also possible i mean firing in a confined space there's a thing we talk about called um uh, you know, if people, you can have it happen where if somebody fires a weapon too close to your face, it can literally, like, the powder flash can can blind you or at least temporarily blind you. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, they're dangerous. It, when you, it makes more sense when you see a gun like an M4 being fired at night because the light that escapes from the muzzle, like the, the sort of quick flame burst that comes out. Mm. Or if you see it, if you if you're watching it through night vision or through infrared, you'll see there's a lot coming out of of the the barrel. Like it's not just the bullet. I mean, there's a lot of smoke and flash and stuff like that. And that's that's gunpowder. Okay. That's that's gunpowder. You know, exploding and, and 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 it's the combustion that's propelling that round out of the barrel. But then also as the the round exits, there's other stuff coming out from all of that gunpowder that was in the in in the round. And so. You know, that that's that's really dangerous. Like, you have to absolutely be careful when you're firing, like, even in a firefight, to not fire. Mm-hmm. If you're firing that close to somebody's face, you know, that's that's really dangerous. And, I mean, we weren't always the best about everyone wearing hearing protection. They've gotten better about that because they have better hearing protection options than they did. Uh, right. You know, like, the special operator guys always have good stuff, but, like, regular grunt soldiers didn't. But they were pretty rigorous. I, I Even, you know, when I was in, you know, 12 years ago, always wearing eye protection and one of the reasons was that Mm. you know because of of stuff like powder burns and things along those lines where you could you could find yourself you know a situation beyond that i'm also like you know debris shrapnel like smoke etc like stuff can can irritate your eyes but guns are loud they're really loud they blow stuff out of the barrel when they're firing for the same reason that you can be hurt or killed by a blank round because of the stuff that's coming out of the barrel Mm. You know, it's the same thing, except also a bullet when it's a live round. Right, right. And I understand, too, that silencers, as well, people call them, they don't actually mm-hmm. silence anything. I know in the movies, whenever there's a an assassin with a little pistol uh-huh. with a silencer, it makes it quiet little... Yeah, and that's it. I'm guessing that's not quite how it works. So, so yeah, silencers are suppressors. They they do reduce the overall volume, but it's still incredibly loud. It's just not as loud. I see. And I think that the thing about that is, is that you have to realize just how loud these things are. I mean, like it's unmistakable when you hear it in person that it's gunfire because it's so loud. It's like this crack noise. Whether or not it's a bullet flying over your head, which is different than just hearing the what we call the report, like the the sound of a, of a round going on of a gunfire. Mm. But they're loud, and so you know, I don't know off the top of my head the facts of what suppressors will do. But like, if you're reducing it by say 30 or 40 decibels or something like that, that's significant. But it's still absolutely audible like there's right. a reason why the weapon of choice as i understand it for like mafia hitmen was a 22 caliber pistol with a suppressor using low velocity ammunition because that's a small bullet it's a small charge and especially if you use low velocity am- ammunition it's less gunpowder so it's just less noise overall and a suppressor but that's that's it's not a big bullet at all 
And so, you know, things like that, like that's, that's people who were, you know, committing crimes, murdering people where silence was absolutely or, or, or quiet was, you know, of value to them. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they couldn't just slap a suppressor on, uh, you know, a forty five caliber handgun or something like that. I mean, okay. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be quiet enough, if that makes sense. So they do absolutely reduce reduce the sound but they don't reduce it to the point where like it, it sounds like like a ziploc bag being zipped or something it's more right. it's more like you could hear it inside the building as opposed to you could hear it from a block away you know I what see. i mean yeah 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 that makes a lot of sense okay um let's see we talked about sound we talked well let's talk a little bit about damage if mm-hmm. you're if you if you don't mind um yeah, no worries. i've noticed that in movies guns and bullets have two modes of damage either a you know they shoot you in the shoulder and you're fine mm-hmm. or b you're you get shot and the entire upper half of your body explodes <laughs> and yeah. that's it <laughs> yeah one of the two yeah yeah. Um, well, so what? What's it more like? I'm sure. Obviously, it depends on the type of gun. The it type does, of and, and type, stuff, type of bullet. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, so it really depends because. So I mean, a couple of things you have to consider. Obviously, the the caliber of bullet, the type of weapon, and the material of the bullet as well, and also where a person is hit. But so one of the things that that's been reported recently about the, the the very traumatic aftermath of a lot of these mass shootings in the United States where people have used AR-15 variants or a, like AK-47 variants is that those guns, those those weapons fire bullets that travel a lot faster than a handgun bullet, for example. Hmm. So a 9mm bullet is actually bigger than the bullet that an AR-15 fires. An AR-15's hmm. bullet is not much bigger than a 22 caliber bullet. Uh, as I understand it, from what I remember shooting these things, when I fired a 22 caliber rifle, the bullet is is it's pretty close in size, maybe slightly smaller. But an AR-15's bullet, the the round looks big because it's got all that powder behind it. But the bullet itself okay. is not that big. An AK-47 bullet, which is a 7.62 millimeter bullet, is bigger. But even that, it's not huge. Um, it's it's just, it, but the, the the fact is, those those kinds of weapons fire rounds that, I mean, I want to say, it's been a long time, we used to have to memorize this stuff, and I, I don't remember it, but I, I want to say you can fire, I mean, you, you absolutely can fire an, an AR-15, you know, variant accurately, if you know what you're doing, up to like 500 meters. Wow. So, it's a long ways. Now, we tra- yeah. the, the, the Marine Corps, if I remember correctly, trains up to 500 meters in their target ranges, the Army trains up to 300 meters, but... Even 300 meters is far. That's three, yeah, foot, that's three really football fields. So you that's imagine huge. that that law, that, and that's accurate. That's on the firing range when you do qualification. You are expected to be able to hit. Yeah, you know, I want to say it's like four 300 meter targets. So this isn't like a like an American sniper thing. This is every soldier who fires a weapon in, in the U.S. Army has to know how to is, is supposed to be able, even just using the iron sights, like not with an optic or anything, just like the the sights on the back and front of a rifle, be able to hit a target at 300 meters. So you think about how much force is behind that bullet. Whereas a yeah. pistol, um, when I qualified uh, firing with a pistol, the we were we were shooting at 25 meters. And to be wow. honest with you, it's kind of hard to hit something accurately unless you really know what you're doing with a pistol at more yeah. than 20, 25 meters. And yeah. the bullets, although they're bigger, they they aren't going anywhere near as fast, and they tend to like pancake when they hit a person. And so, absolutely, mm-hmm. there's trauma. You know, like it penetrates the flesh, bone, etc. But a bullet from a handgun has a tendency to like pancake into a thing, and it's easy, relatively easy to remove from someone's body. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, a bullet from an assault rifle goes in and it bounces all around inside their body it's going so fast that it causes so much trauma inside so like it's a weird thing because that's something that i don't think gets represented those bullets aren't big for the ak-47 it's got a lot more stopping power than an ar-15 but they're they're both not huge bullets but they cause so much damage to you that i mean that's that's the reason why in one of these mass shooting situations, someone's shot and they might be shot, you know, like in a part of their body that's not necessarily, they're not hitting vital organs, but a person might be shot, say like in the pelvis and the bullet goes out their shoulder and it tears wow. up all the, all of their, you know, all of their internal organs as it goes through their body. So it's a really, it's a really unpleasant topic, but the point being here that that's not really represented. And, and a lot of stuff no. isn't represented in, in, in uh, other thing too is, you know, when someone gets shot, they bleed a lot, <laughs> like yeah. a lot more than ever gets represented. And I feel like movies would be so gruesome if they actually represented this in real life. And there's a part of me right. that's like, I wish they would. So people would be more grossed out by it. But there's another part of me that's like, yeah, but they would just get desensitized to it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is the, the threat. Like I, I, I have wondered that cause I understand, I know um, gunplay has just been a thing in American movies and American pop culture for so long. And a friend of mine told me, 
me that on television they don't show blood just because it's not really no. too gross and depressing but like there's this side where I'm thinking is that just making gun violence more palatable like we're sanitizing yeah. this idea of shooting a person is kind of fucked up people are always weirded out by it um you know because you'll see this stuff in, in movies where somebody is shot and then like they fall over and there's like a little bit of blood but, but not much whereas in real life right it's ever it's everywhere we got a lot of blood in us there's a yeah. lot yeah and that's the thing too that you'll that you'll i mean it's feel free to cut this if it's too much for your listeners but something that, that that all the times that i encounter people who were dead who'd been shot they were soaked head to toe in blood like their oh, clothes God. were all soaked in blood because they'd bled out you know they died and there's so much like you said there's so much blood in a human body so contrast that to a movie where somebody is shot and there's like you know what looks like a ketchup stain on their shirt and nothing <laughs> right. else right so i mean it, it really there's a part of me that thinks, oh, well, if you did this, that people might be more aware of it. But then there's another part of me that's like, yeah, but that doesn't really seem to stop other things that are, you know, graphic and, and kind of depraved from being portrayed. So, you know, would it make a difference? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, but but the, the the kind of like, oh, I've been shot in the shoulder and I'll keep going. I mean, <laughs> is that possible? Yeah, it is. Because people, people, your body reacts in such a way. I mean, I've never been shot, but, you know, people have a lot of adrenaline, you know, and, and stuff can, people can power through this stuff. But I mean, I think, well, that's one of the things that doesn't really get talked about um, is how much damage, these, especially the assault weapons can do. And then even if a person can power through because like they're running on adrenaline, like, that doesn't mean they won't die. It doesn't mean that, that when, when they, they're able to rest, that they won't basically go into shock and then not be revived. Or so, like bleed out or something. Or? Yeah, or just, you know, have something like where they, their body just kind of shuts down because there's been so much, there's been so much trauma to some organs or, you know, something along those lines where like, you know, after the fact, their heart might fail or something like that. Or you like you said, or, or, or bleed out or, I mean, there's a lot of complications that can happen. And, and also it takes a long time to recover from an injury like that. Oh, of course. I mean, and so that's one of the things that that always like like if somebody gets shot and it's it's more than just like a like a graze or what you would describe as a flesh wound like something that kind of like went in and went out and just penetrated muscle like it's going to be months for them to recover oh yeah like, yeah and so that's something that i think it's like especially on like procedurals on tv it'll just be yeah. like oh yeah this guy got shot he's like back at work the next day it's like uh, he's got an arm his arm in a sling but he's yeah, fine he's fine yeah <laughs> absolutely oh gosh um all right. Well, let's go over a little bit of terminology. I know this is something that um, that sort of gun people like to make fun of anti-gun yeah. liberals for getting wrong on the internet. Um, it's not an assault rifle. That's not real. Mm -hmm. That's not a clip. That's a magazine. Or that's yeah. not a yeah. bullet. That's a cartridge or whatever. So can yeah. we go over a little bit of this basic terminology? Sure. Yeah. And, and I think I, as a preface to this, I would like to say that I don't think that any of this the, the kind of like pedantic one-upmanship, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that's completely useless. I do think there's there's value in knowing what you're talking about. Of course. When I was probably about 14 or so, there was a mass shooting, uh, like a white nationalist went into Bloomington, Indiana, which is the town oh, where God. Indiana University is, and shot up, like he killed a bunch of, of international students on the street. Oh, and the mayor man. gave a press conference and he was like, I can't believe someone was able to come into this town with a semi-automatic weapon, semi weapon of mass destruction. And he sounded like an idiot, unfortunately, on TV. And right. it was one of those things because it's like, well, yeah, semi-automatic weapon, that's basically, those are completely legal. Like, you can buy them anywhere. And right. it, it certainly it certainly wouldn't qualify as a weapon of mass destruction. But right. the point being there, like, that's one of those things where, okay, maybe don't, don't put your foot in your mouth. But not knowing the difference between a round and a cartridge and a bullet, I mean, I, I'm less worried about that but I'll, I'll go over some of it just so people know so right so the, the thing i'll start with is, is the bullet is the part of metal of a round when i say a round that's the brass casing that has both a firing um like a detonator in the back of the cartridge um the back of the the, the round casing and then there's gunpowder inside it and mm -hmm. so basically when you pull the trigger what happens mechanically is that causes the firing pin to push in and penetrate that it's, a, it's it's like a firing cap or like a blasting cap and mm -hmm. that that cap you know is primed so that when pr when it, it's put under pressure it pops basically which detonates the gunpowder which causes the bullet to eject through the barrel and then you know go down its way to, to hit whatever you aimed at hopefully if you're a good shot when that happens in a semi-automatic weapon that all that gas that i was talking about like that pops out the, comes out the barrel when you fire well, that's, it's coming out the barrel, but it's also creating a lot of back pressure when it's blowing out, you know? Right. So what that back pressure does is that it forces 
that uh, basically there's a, there, the bolt of the weapon back towards you know back towards the trigger. And what so like when you rack the slide on a pistol or when you pull the charging handle on a rif- on an assault rifle, what that's do- it's the same action. It's pulling the bolt back. When in this case the pressure is blowing the bolt back, that it hits a spring. So when it goes back, it causes that brass casing to eject out the side of the weapon or the top mm-hmm. of the weapon or wherever the ejection port is. And then when it bounces off that spring and goes back forward, that causes it to rack or push forward another bullet out of the magazine or not bullet round out of the magazine you see even i'm mixing these things up because the doctrinal term would be round but like casually we just call it a bullet Mm -hmm. um and so what so basically that uh when the bolt pushes forward it bounces off that spring it has now chambered another round and you can pull the trigger again so that's why it's it's semi-automatic because that reloading mechanism is automatic but you pulling the trigger is not automatic you can't just hold the trigger down and just shoot bullets over and over again that would be an automatic if you could and okay. so oh, already we've talked about a couple of things here. So the bullet is the metal, the, the round casing or, uh, or the cartridge is the brass part with the blasting cap or firing cap and uh, the gunpowder. And the whole thing together would be a round. And then um, sometimes you'll hear this called shells for shotguns, for example, that would be a shell. A shotgun doesn't, typically doesn't have a single projectile, but rather a bunch of things packed into one. So shells would typically, as I understand it, would only typically be used for talking about shotguns or like something way beyond small arms, like talking about like artillery pieces and things like that, which that's a little, unless you're writing military fiction is a little bit out there. So if you're talking right. about, you're talking about handguns, shotguns, et cetera, shells are only used for shotgun. I see. If that makes sense. And then, and then obviously you have um, all those pieces of brass on the ground afterwards. Like when you see that, or like the pieces of brass flying out, those are the spent casings. Mm -hmm. Um, from rounds that have been fired. Sometimes you'll see really weird pictures, like illustrations, cartoons, et cetera, where someone's like shooting and like, it's like bullets flying, but it's, it's got the brass casing on it. And if that happens, something has gone really wrong in real life (laughs) because that, that should not be, that, 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 that cannot happen in real life. I mean, it, it, it can only happen in the, the deranged mind of whoever made those weird Carl Heasty U S Navy SEAL fucking like memes about him, the weird, like right wing Navy SEAL guy. Because that can't happen in real life. So it's the, it's the little bullet that's fi- <laughs> flying and that brass casing, that's the spent container that had all that gunpowder behind it. Okay. Okay. Cool. And the difference between a clip and a magazine. Okay. Well, so in the olden days, uh, if, you, if you see World War II movies like Saving Private Ryan, there's a scene where they're firing when this happens uh, and they're firing an M1 Garand and it fires five rounds in succession. And then you hear a ping and this thing fires off. That's the clip. In the olden days, you had rounds in a clip where that's how they came packaged and you hmm. loaded them directly into the rifle that way. And as I understand it, you didn't reload the clip yourself. You, you, you In a training scenario or something, you would take it that you could collect them and they'd be refilled but like you got them from the munitions factory or the ammo resupply or whatever as a clip and they stayed that way and you loaded them into the rifle as a clip a magazine is like a metal container and you load bullets into it individually and it's got a spring on the bottom of it that just basically puts a little bit of pressure on the bottom of the rounds so as one round ejects it kind of like is moving them slowly does that make sense like as each one goes out that spring is pushing and pushing and pushing to like keep raising the rounds to the top and then when it's empty you 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 typically wouldn't throw the magazine away unless you're like in 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 some crazy action movie and you don't need the weapon anymore because you would reload you would reload that magazine and so in a pistol the magazine well is in the grip in 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 like 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 even a, a machine pistol like an uzi the magazine well where you load the magazine is inside the pistol grip so when you see people like slam the bottom of a pistol like in a movie what that's they're typically doing is they're that's because they're putting a new round or new magazine into the weapon mm-hmm. on a, an assault rifle on some hunting rifles a, a bunch of basically what we call long guns uh the magazine well is typically forward of the trigger and so that's why if you see people like holding like the banana clip kind of thing like it's not a clip. Right. That's that's actually a magazine. But the the long magazine is typically like a thirty or a forty five round magazine. Um, the reason why it's it, sometimes people will draw them and they'll like it'll be like fucking weird. They'll draw them like like that's the thing you hold on to. But you're probably doing something wrong if you're holding on to the magazine. It's just mm-hmm. um, it's it's the thing that's feeding bullets into the into the weapon. If that makes sense. okay, that makes sense. Definitely. All right. Let's talk a little bit about marksmanship. Um, I'm guessing that most uh, films show our hero being unusually good at marksmanship. Yes. Oh my <laughs> I, God, I've, yes. I've, I've definitely not like 
I'm have absolutely no military service, but I have like gone to a shooting range and stuff before and was startled by how hard it is to hit things. Yeah. Especially with a pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Pistol's super a bad hard. place to start. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. Uh so, so could that be a, a, a thing to discuss? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so I think the thing about marksmanship is that it, a lot of it's really boring and just rote, but also mm-hmm. a lot of it depends on the, the weapon in question. And I think the thing that, that really get people missed in, in films and such where this is portrayed is that some of it is fundamentals, like knowing how to squeeze the trigger, knowing how to control your breathing when you're shooting, knowing how to you know, uh, hold the rifle in such a way that you're keeping the, the, the position of the rifle versus your eye the same each time so that like if you're because mm. I mean because basically if you're not looking at down the sights the same way on a rifle or, or on a pistol the same way then when you're making corrections it's kind of useless because unless you you know unless you can literally see the bullets impacting um you you're not you you know like you're not correcting anything you're just shooting you're, you're basically shooting wildly unless you're looking down the same way each time and so training people to do that to like hold it the same way to look the same way to uh breathe correctly to squeeze the trigger correctly that stuff is what you you learn it you practice it and that stuff is fundamental but then another big component of this is the weapon itself because every weapon is different every right. every model or every individual item of even the same kind of weapon is different. And you have to become accustomed to that weapon. So whether it's a pistol or whether it's a, an assault rifle or whether it's, you know, a, a, a long, like a hunting rifle or a sniper rifle or something along those lines, especially when you get into sniper things or like deer, deer hunting scopes and stuff where those optics are very like that. You, you, you Those are dialed in individually to the shooter. And if you hand that off to another shooter, unless he's already, unless for some reason you have the exact same shooting profile, He's not going to be accurate through that scope the way that you are because mm. because it's not what we call zeroing. It's not zeroed, if that makes sense. And so, okay, a lot of a lot of like movie devices where I mean, I'll give you a great example. Have you ever seen the the first Taken film? I haven't. Sp- spoiler alert: at the end, Liam Neeson <laughs> finds the guy who's kidnapped his daughter and wants to sell her into sexual slavery for a bunch of you know venal Gulf Arabs who travel the world abducting women. Uh, it's right. it's really bad. Um, and the guy is holding a gun to this girl's head and basically holding her in front of him. And Liam Neeson, in like this quick, deft move, has secured a pistol from someone and just, just is able to laser target, shoot this guy in the head and not hit his daughter. Wow. Now, in real life, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on my pistol marksmanship if I hadn't fired that gun before to know that I would actually hit that person because you honestly have zero idea, like based on looking down the sights yourself, where it's going to hit. Right, even at that right. close range. Because... Like I said, every gun is different, and Absolutely. Uh, and pistols in particular, I think, are, are are rough to train on and rough to use in real life because any little movement of your hand, any shakiness, any change in your 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 body position from normal, and it's kind of it's kind of you know game on. Like you don't know what's going to happen. Famously, I want to say in like 2014 or 2015, uh, there was a shooting in New York where a disgruntled employee came up to, uh, ex-employee came out to his boss on the street and shot him at like, like 42nd Street or someplace close to that. Like it was in Midtown Manhattan and seven people were shot. But wow. it was later revealed that the guy shot his boss, the cops shot him and wounded five other people because of ricochets because they fucking suck at shooting. Holy shit. And all their bullets bounced and people were like hiding and trying to get away. And those bullets ricocheting off the streets. And those are cops who are in the NYPD, which is it's hard to get a job in the NYPD. And they're trained on those things. Yeah. So you understand that like your average person with a gun, especially if they've never fired it before, like point blank, maybe. I mean, let's hope you can shoot something at point blank and, and be successful. But like any kind of marksmanship, it, it, it's, it, it would be absurd to assume that somebody could do that. And people who do this stuff for a living would never take those chances. Uh, I mean, the cops might, but I mean, the cops can get away with anything in America. Um, yeah. But people who, who actually have to be good at shooting, <laughs> they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't take those chances because it's just, it's just too fickle. Right. Even with, a, even with a rifle. And I mean, like, so one of the things we do, like when you go out to a shooting range in the military, before you you are able to uh, go and actually shoot like the 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 what they call like the firing tables or the the you know the 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 qualification table where you have to do like a certain number of targets on a pop up range they make you go to uh, a zero range 
And what they mean by zeroing is basically that you're dialing the weapon into like your individual shooter profile. And so you you go and you shoot basically a silhouette target that's from the distance you're shooting. It looks like what a 300 meter target would look like from 300 meters away, like a human sized target. So it's a hmm. tiny little speck. You know, it, I think it's like 25 meters or 30, I can't remember what the distance is. And you shoot and you fire. Uh, you, they typically have you fire either three rounds or six rounds. And you're supposed to shoot at center mass the same way each time. And if you're doing your job and your your fundamentals are solid, when you go down and you inspect that target after everyone's done shooting, you should have a very tight group, if not right on top of each other, of three round, three bullet holes or six bullet holes or whatever, because you're shooting the same way every time, if you're doing your job right. But if you're not, they're going to be all over the place and you have to work on, you, it'll tell you, you know, based on if it's up or down, it's, uh, I think that's breathing. If it's left or right, that's trigger squeeze, like stuff like that, but to dial it in. But you basically make soldiers train on this over and over again to of get course. those fundamentals right. Because otherwise when they're shooting at distance, they're not going to be accurate. And that's whether you're an infantryman, whether you're a paratrooper, whether you're, you know, in a ranger unit or whether you're in like, you know, a re- army reserve cook or linen, linen cleaning unit, it doesn't matter. That's how you go about training on these things because otherwise you're ineffective. And so when I see stuff in movies like that, like I'm not, I, I don't, all right. I would say I don't get mad about the stuff, but I'm sure my wife can hear me through the wall and she's probably <laughs> laughing because she's like, yes, you fucking do. Because it is, it, it can be so absurd to see how these things play out where like a big dramatic hinge in a film or in a story involves some kind of like matrix style gunplay that just isn't possible in real life. I and I mean, I'm sure that's how cops feel when they watch police procedurals. And they're just like, this is so stupid. But it's right. why, it's why me watching a movie like The Hurt Locker, I'm just like, I'm just mad now. <laughs> All right. Uh, Segging from that, can you think of an example of a book or a movie that actually really gets it right? That's actually really fairly accurate. Um, you know, I might be the rump, but um, huh? Um, I thought book-wise, two books that I've read that I thought did a pretty good job of capturing just like the general awfulness of like kind of how what firefights are like, uh, which would be military books would be. Dennis Johnson's Tree of Smoke and Carl Morlanti's Matterhorn, which are both mm-hmm. about Vietnam. I'd also say if you've ever, the best book about war that I think I've ever read is James Jones' The Thin Red Line. Mm-hmm. And that contains segments that sort of like give you an idea of what infantry combat was like in World War II. Is that the same as the, like a police thing? No, and it's not like watching Law and Order, but it might give you a <laughs> sense of sort of what, what these weapons are intended for. And how that plays out in real life. I definitely think that the scene in Three Kings where I want to say it's Mark Wahlberg's character gets sepsis from getting shot. While it's it's not realistic medically, like that at least gives you some indication of kind of the, the shit that happens when people get wounded. And how it's not just like a plot device or like an afterthought. Like it becomes a big deal when someone's wounded. So if, you've, if you haven't seen Three Kings, it's a uh, great Oh, it's great. great I movie. loved it. Yeah, great movie. I definitely recommend it. I'm trying to I remember think. the bit where he's got that thing in his chest and he's got to yeah, 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 keep messing he's, with he's it. He's got to open the valve because his, his, his body is, is going septic. Yeah. I also would say, and this is maybe a, a cop out because it's, it's sort of known for this, but um, I don't like Saving Private Ryan's story because hmm. I, I find that the, the plot is it's just like hapless cliches that all come together to basically encourage what I might describe as fascist thought. But I will say that the first 20 minutes, the scene where they're landing at, at Omaha Beach, I didn't really appreciate it when I was younger. And then I watched them again after I'd gotten out of the army. And, and mind you, I was never in a firefight that was 100th as insane as what those guys experienced. But a lot of the stuff in there with like the way bullets sound when they're going overhead or just like the sheer confusion, the amount of times people are having to get down because there's just stuff going off all around them. Uh, that really resonated with my experience. And so... I would definitely say watch that. Oh, and also this is like every every dude in his mid-30s uh, from America. I love the movie Children of Men. And that also oh, yeah. gets a lot right about guns in terms of um, if you think about the the amount that the, the uh, I'm forgetting the character's name. But um, the, when 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 the leader of the fishes gets shot in the car, the amount that she bleeds from getting shot in the neck. Right. That's an example of like it being a little bit more realistic or... And I know Theo, his ears are ringing at yeah, one point yeah, yeah, where yeah, there's yeah, a firefight yeah, yeah. around him. Mm-hmm. His ears yeah, start yeah. ringing. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was from a bomb going off, but yeah, she. Um, oh, okay. yeah. Whoops. Uh, but then also the 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 gun battle at the end when they're in Beck's Hill, uh, in the refugee camp. The way that people have to move, like everyone's moving, like keeping their heads down. The way that like it, 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 people are panicking, and it's really loud. Like that. While it's not, I mean, there's still a lot of like dumb gunplay. Um, I definitely think that that film gets a lot more right, and it feels way more accurate to like the way and also that the the firefight in the in the building at the end where um Chiwetel Ejiofor's character dies um that mm-hmm. like how they're they're basically engaging with people that have similar caliber weapons like that that seemed realistic to me so there are things where it, I've seen it done well but I think that it's more likely that things will be there'll be a little bit more attention to detail on that stuff in movies than in TV cuz I mean in TV a lot of times like they yeah. just don't have the budget for it of course I'm trying to think what else you did mention something about like the, the, the comical alternate version of this where like somebody gets shot and they just, they just like explode. Right. Uh, the only movie I've ever seen that actually kind of has something like that happen where it feels realistic in the sense that that's actually what would happen in real life is I want to say it's Rambo four, the one where he's in huh. Mi- when he's in Myanmar, which is funny because the other Rambos are very, very like almost like bloodless. Like they're very, yeah. mild by comparison but the one where he's in Myanmar there's a scene at the end where he basically gets control of a 50 caliber machine gun which was is an anti-personnel weapon but it was designed as an anti-aircraft weapon in uh, in and around wow. World War II and so it's a big big gun and um, he starts shooting people with his 50 cal and bad things start happening to them physically that I won't gross people out by describing but it's it's not a pretty scene at all and it's a really violent and kind of irredeemable movie but that is closer to what happens in real life when a gun that big hits people than some of the stuff you'll see in, you know, like on TV, for example. So, of course. I, but I also think a lot of that, too, also stems from the fact that movies, like even watching like Commando, which, you know, came out around the same time as Rambo 2, uh, or movies like Platoon, or um, stuff from the late 80s, like, like Patriot Games. Movies, even when there was violence, they weren't anywhere near as violent as they are now. And there is kind of like, like you can you can get away with more gore and violence in an R-rated movie than I think you could back then. And huh. so I I have seen like like for example in um what's it called uh in Enemy at the Gates there's a scene where people are fleeing off a boat that's been capsized and like a political commissar is calling them cowards and just like shooting people who are trying to flee. And in one scene he this this commissar or whatever shoots a guy in the back as he's swimming and it's the the shot is done in such a way that like you you as the viewer see the guy's hand and arm reaching out and firing and then the, the you know the the round obviously impacting in the back of the soldier who's trying to swim and Ugh. it's like it's gross but that's at least a little bit more accurate in terms of it's not like sanitized but also it's a little bit creepy in the sense that, you know, when they were making a movie like that, you know, as they were going through pre-production and production, they had to storyboard out like, oh, here's where this guy is going to very obviously shoot this guy and you're going to see it all. So there is a kind of like almost gore kind of creepy factor to it that stuff like that gets kind of dwelled upon at times. Yeah, yeah. But you don't really see that on TV, which is, to be fair, probably where most people see most of the dumb gunplay. Absolutely. <laughs> Aside from pop culture and aside from joining the military, which seems like a little <laughs> Not, bit of an extreme way yeah. to, to do this, what are some other really good ways to learn all this stuff? Well, I mean, I think I, I definitely think so weird saying this, <laughs> but if you watch like safety videos on YouTube, those tend to be like gun safety videos. Those, the, Even if they're made by people who might be you don't want to watch their videos about who did 9-11, uh, they, te- <laughs> they tend to be pretty, pretty accurate in terms of. Uh, describing the stuff and talking about you know everything from like the terminology to like the mechanics like they'll reassemble disassemble and reassemble weapons they'll they'll talk about shooting things like that definitely reading um non-fiction stuff about the military or about you know like if, for example if you reading about like the history of SWAT teams and stuff like that you'll pick up on some of these things hmm. and and also i would say if you want to try it i mean there are there are, there are places where you can go and learn to shoot or at least get a chance to try shooting even if you're not like really drilling into the the mechanics of it and i think that can be useful if you're a writer and you're trying to write about something that involves guns i definitely think that you can learn a lot and ter- like experientially about it by Absolutely. doing it yourself if you go to a range or a place where you can fire you know with an instructor or under supervision or whatever and that that mitigates the the concern of, you know, like, am I doing it right? Is it safe, et cetera? 
and then also right. you get a chance to see it because I mean obviously I think when like it's funny because an AR-15 isn't that loud compared to other guns but I think when you when you fire when you, re- you see how loud it is and what happens and like the smoke and the smell and stuff like that because there's, there's kind of like the cordite smell when when the gunpowder's gone off right knowing that experiencing that that gives you puts you in a better position to be able to describe it uh, in writing absolutely maybe don't be like that guy who went and fought, shot an AR-15 and then said he had PTSD from it. <laughs> What? That it was yeah, it was some guy. He was like a columnist oh, no. in New Jersey, and of course, like every rage vet site out there, like angry veterans will share that and make fun of this guy. Oh, of course. So yeah, I mean, maybe don't be like that guy, but um, but I definitely <laughs> think you know there there are ways to learn about it. And then I mean, yeah, I I I think really when you get down to it, if you if you read about some of this stuff or you you know you read about the history of things like you know certain kinds of things about law enforcement or the military or how these battles played out or you watch stuff like i said like safety videos and just if you just understand that the matrix shouldn't be your baseline for realism then i think that it's pretty easy to it's really not hard to get it right i mean people will make mistakes but that's pretty easily fact checked like something that if you're working on something if you have like an editing partner or reading or like a preferred reader or if you you know if you're at the point where you're trying to submit a manuscript or something like that, maybe you might want to talk to like like a sensitivity reader or something and people can look at it and tell you if it sounds weird. But I mean, more than anything else, this stuff is is pretty easy to find online. So I, I don't think that it, it requires people to like to stress about it. Okay. I definitely think that the biggest thing is just if you bear in mind that guns are loud and they're right. they're they make a lot of noise. They they put out a lot of smoke, a lot of um there's a, a lot of force behind the bullet. And in the military, at least, less so with the police, but certainly in the military, the way weapons are employed is typically it's less pinpoint accuracy, s- sniping people, you know, like like you're playing Fortnite and more like it's pe- lots of people shooting at once so that the other people keep their heads down and don't pop up kind of stuff. Hmm. As you understand that like there's there's it's less the chivalric hero sniping people from 100 meters or, or 500 meters away and more just like lots of bullets flying and other stuff flying, then you, you get an understanding that like, it's not, it's not this acrobatics. It's just, it's a, it, it's used as a tool, if that makes sense. I see. Okay. Well, uh, before we go, do you have anything else you'd like to add or anything you'd like to plug? I'll plug my two shows. So I, I run a podcast called What a Hell of a Way to Die. We are a socialist leftist veterans podcast. We talk about veterans and military issues, news stories, culture, things, etc. If you uh, if you like the show and you you know of any great Marine Todd memes, I'm always interested in seeing more of them because it's an amazing <laughs> thing. I also uh, have a, a UK politics kind of leftist comedy news podcast called Trash Future. So if you're interested in what's going on in Britain and why it seems so insane all the time, um, you can definitely listen to that as well. Though both those shows are available on um, Apple Podcasts, on uh, ver- the, the, the different aggregators out there. I can't name all of them, but they, they also have a presence on SoundCloud, so you can find them there too. So if you, if you want to hear more from me and other people and not just me talking, uh, look up those shows. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope this was informative or at least entertaining. Oh, totally. I really appreciate it. All right. Now, that is all for this episode. If you like what you heard, check out our Patreon and subscribe. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash rightgood. That's R-I-T-E-G-U-D. Subscribers get access to the Discord and some bonus content. Thank you for listening. And join us next time when we talk about why you should write about losers. Good night. This has been Right Good with R.S. Benedict. Hosted by R.S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittysneezes.com. That's R I T E G U D at kittysneezes.com. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash writegood. Kittysneezes.com in color.